This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Safraz Manzur. Hey. Close enough? Pretty good. Okay. All right. Uh, writer slash inspiration of Blinded by the Light, uh, a story from your childhood growing up and sort of learning to appreciate the world around you through the music of Bruce Springsteen. Um, the first thing I wanted to sort of talk about, and this is just a weird sort of practical question, maybe it's different for writers, but what made you decide to write an autobiography when you were, what, 30 years old? Like, how, <laughs> how, how do you decide to do that? Like, it's just, it's just one of those things that, like, A, how, how long you've lived life, and, like, know when to stop. Like, when is enough of a story? Uh, the reason I'm laughing is that's what a lot of people said to me, um, including my own family. They were like, what on earth are you doing writing a book as a memoir? So um, I was actually 36, I think, when it came out, something like that. And so the, the, the real answer to that is I hadn't actually thought of writing an, a memoir at all. I was actually a journalist. I write for lots of newspapers in Britain. And I got contacted by a literary agency who contacted me, a big one, ICM. And they basically said, we really like your writing. Have you thought about writing a book? Interesting. And I had never thought of writing a book for exactly the reason that you just <laughs> said. And they said, no, we think you can write. We think there's something in it. Um, if you could write any book, what would you write about? And I was like, well, the thing about writing books is you have to be sort of interested in enough, enough in a subject that you can focus for 18 months, two years on it. So what could I focus on and what would be <laughs> interesting for me? And I thought, well, I think Springsteen would be that thing, you know, because okay. I do feel like that story is an unusual story, but it's a way, it's a prism of seeing one's life. It's a bit unusual than just saying this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Sure. Um, and it also allowed me to just think about Bruce for 18 months or two Pretty years. Good deal, yeah. Yeah. So to be honest, it wasn't my calling to do it. It wasn't, I didn't ask to do it. Somebody asked me to do it and that's why I ended up writing it. It sort of leads into my second question is, what made you think you could write a screenplay? <laughs> no, no, no. I actually think that, that wasn't even on the radar. But I, it's sort of similar in that so you lived the life, you wrote the book, worked on the screenplay, and have seen the film made about your life. Like, it's sort of this inception level of, like, multiple tiers and stuff. I don't know if anyone's ever lived 1987 more than you, but what is it <laughs> sort of like going through that? So it's like, uh, was it a... Uh, um, the Jim Carrey movie where he keeps living the same day, or no, Groundhog Day. It's like Groundhog, Groundhog Day, day where yes. you're like living the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. What is it, was it like sort of like going through that repeatedly and sort of experiencing it so many times? I mean, you know, it is, it's so weird. That's all I can say, it's so weird. And it's, the reason it's weird is because you live the life and at that time, there are no aspirations that you'll ever get recorded, yeah. Writing about it isn't that weird, actually, like writing a book. Mm. That's because that's it feels kind of secluded. Do you know what I mean? You're basically sure, yeah. sitting there on your own saying these things happened. And yeah, people may read about it afterwards. But in that moment, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody else cares. and Nobody's invested in it. It's basically just you and the editor of the book. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a small, it's a, in a way, it's a smaller thing. But the process of fictionalizing the truth in That's such a I way, was, yeah. in such a way that it's not going to be just fiction, because I was, it was really important to me that it wasn't just fiction. So how you fictionalize but still retaining truth mm -hmm. is crazy. Then this is the bit that's the most crazy part. It's the bit when other people start buying into it. So even if you write a screenplay, okay, which is loosely based on your life, it's still not that big a deal. It's when you walk in to a production office that says, blinded by the light, you walk in and there are walls, <laughs> like in this room, okay, with photographs pinned on them of you. That's amazing. Then there's other walls of mood board of things that might be in your house. Another mood boards of the town you grew up in. <laughs> That's what's really crazy. And then you get to the point where you meet the actors who are going to be playing yourself and, you know, your friends and your family or whatever. And then you go on set. And again, so I grew up in Luton, as you might know, right? So it's, yeah, yeah. it's not a town that gets that much attention in this, in cinematically, okay? And in the middle of Luton, there is a feature film crew who have come to town. Rob Brydon, who's a quite a big yeah, star, yeah, great. he's there. There's all these people, and they're all there because of I grew up there, 
and of the stuff that me and my mate did when we were 16. I mean, isn't that nuts? But there's also another layer, and maybe this is something that comes in down the line once you get older. At what point does the fictionalized version start seeping back into your real life? And you're like, was it like that? I, I can't remember exactly. There which is way. that. There is that. There really is that. So I'll give you an example. In the film, um, I discover the music because this friend of mine I bump into in the corridor. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's true. He did. He did introduce me, and he looks like that. But I, it wasn't in a corridor. It was in a. It was in a different room. So sometimes I forget that myself. <laughs> you know. But I'll tell you the most. The weirdest part um, is that it's about my dad. Because my dad died when I was 23 years old. Oh. Okay, he died like six years after the film is set. And Kulvinda plays my dad eerily well. They've dressed him like him. Wow. They've made him up to look like him. You know, if you look at a photograph of my dad, which I can show you, yeah. and you see a photograph of Kulvinda, it's uncanny. Yeah? Interesting. And the thing that I found really weird recently is that my memories, my visual memories of my dad have started to slightly mm. blur with the memories of with, with, with Kulvinda. And I'm having to work really hard to hold on to what my dad really looked like, mm. not the fresh images of Kulvinda. So that's an example of where the blurring is happening. Well, there's, there's another thing off of that that comes in too, and that's the sort of... It's interesting to sort of look back at this in several different periods of your life, you know, as a child, then as like, you know, in your 30s when you wrote the book, and now like, yeah. has, has the aging process changed how you look back on your childhood? Like, like, I mean, obviously there's some of that during writing the book, but yeah. like as an adult or a father or whatever, yeah. looking back and being yeah, like, there is. I understand my dad so much more now, yeah. or I would have done this different. Well, do you know what I think it is? I think that when you're 16, you very re it's very rare to have any empathy for your parents when you're 16. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's I just totally not going to happen. So when I was writing the book, the first couple of drafts were quite angry, mm -hmm. as in the dad was quite, my dad was quite a fierce, tyrannical, obstacle kind of character. And it was, as I started, kept, kept looking at it, I kept thinking, I don't feel like this is quite, I don't think I'm really nailing him. I feel like it's too simplistic. Mm. And this is in my mid-30s when I was writing this. And I thought, you know, I've got, to, I've got to have a bit more empathy for who he was. I feel like all I'm doing is basically ranting. And I'm just like ranting and, give, and using the luxury of the fact that I am the writer <laughs> but I'm abusing that luxury. Yeah. So I worked really hard to then think of the world through his eyes. Yeah. Then when it came to the film, I'd had children by this point. Mm. And in a way, one of the themes in the book and one of the themes in the film is this idea about the, how the world is seen differently between the father and the son. And the, one of the things is this idea that, you know, parents often sometimes want to preserve the world that they're in it doesn't matter what background you're from. You know, you want to say, this is what it was like for me. Don't, don't mess it around too much. And that might be, you know, it, it could be about so many different things, you know. And now that I've got kids, I'm seeing that myself, you know. Little things like, you know, we try to kind of, you know, we want our children to read some of the books that we read when we were growing up because we want them to have some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I want my daughter to play the guitar because that's the <laughs> instrument that I think is really cool. And I keep leaning her towards the guitar, even though she wants to play the violin. You kind of want to kind of preserve that world. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm more sympathetic to that now than I would have been before. And I think the film has a little bit more generosity to the dad as a result of that. So it sounds like a pretty therapeutic experience going through us. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know if you've ever got a therapy. I've done that kind no. of stuff in my childhood as well. But uh, the was, therapeutic courtesy of Warner Brothers, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, there are better ways of getting paid to do it. I would say that's a pretty good way to do it. But like, is, is that process of sort of like, as you said, releasing what that initial anger was towards your father really sort of help you? Even it sounds like he was dead by that time, unfortunately, but it sort of allows you to sort of have an experience with them post-mortem or whatever you want to say, where you're sort of like, okay, I understand you now in a way that I didn't before? Um, these are tough questions, you know. Is in, by tough, I mean, you know, it's easy Maybe to... There's kind of, no yes or no to these No, no, what I mean sure. is it's easy to give flippant answers, but if I'm trying to be intelligent and, and yeah. honest with you, so, so what I'm saying is they're not easy answers to just simply yeah. give. But I would say two things on that. One is that 
what it's done is I don't think it's necessarily given me that much closure in that sense. But what it's there's a couple of things it's done. One is I feel like I have honoured him in a way, um, oh, as yeah. in you know he died before I could achieve anything in my life, and I feel like. I've honoured something about him. Totally. Yeah. So I feel like that's an important thing. Um, the second thing I've done is my kids and my wife, who never met him, I feel like I've given them some visual mm, clues as to what he was like. Which, interestingly, when it came to writing the script and working with, you know, the Gorinda and everybody else, it was really important that those things were real because I wanted my kids to grow up feeling that they could have some affinity for that character. That's interesting. So yeah. a little example... You know, he doesn't drink, the character. I don't drink. The dad doesn't drink. If, as, an, as a character plot thing, one of them got drunk, I wouldn't be able to think that was my dad. Yeah. And so that's just an example of what I mean, you know? But the third part, which is the thing which you couldn't um, imagine or conceive, and you certainly couldn't plan, is a response from other people. So this is what's been insane. So I'm talking to you here in Seattle. I've been on a week-long uh, sort of media tour. We've been to New York and San Francisco and LA and Phoenix. And before this, we were in, uh, we've, been, we've been in Vegas as well a couple of months ago. When you hear people, and I'm being honest, when you hear white Americans telling me that the film has moved them, telling me that they've connected to the dad and it's reminded them of yeah. their dad. When you hear people from Korea or Vietnam or Japan or Mexico who are now living, who are from here as well, saying that somehow this story touched them, I just find that mind blowing. And one of my friends told me, she's, she's an American, and she said to me, what you've done is you've turned someone who lived and died in complete anonymity and you've made them an everyman. Well, it's, it's interesting because you're saying like in one side, this is like very specifically your dad, but at the same time, it's something that can be a template for everyone else. Yeah, and that's the mind-blowing part. That's interesting. That's yeah. the, I mean, I didn't do the second part. That's, it's not in my gift to do it. I just try to tell a story. If you're as more honest. talented than you give yourself credit for. Well, no, it's just in the end, I did what Bruce does, mm -hmm. which is, you know, which is probably a grand thing to say. But ultimately, I did the same thing. Bruce talks very specifically about his life. He talks about Asbury Park. He talks about Ocean Avenue and Kingsley Avenue. And he talks about, you know, specific things. And then other people buy into that world. And I tried to do that with, with my story, you know. That's awesome. But that's the bit which I couldn't, you couldn't ever imagine. And it's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an unbelievable feeling to think, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a really weird feeling that I don't know you, right? But you now know that my dad worked at a car factory and you know that he got made redundant and you know that my mum worked making dresses until midnight and you know that, you know, money was tight and you know that I tried to, I worked in a sandwich factory. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's a pretty crazy world. And it's, it's one of those things that you said. There is a lot of universal, universalities to it that are pretty interesting. Uh, one thing I got to ask you about, the most obvious thing is, big Bruce Springsteen fan, uh, you are. I grew up in a generation, I guess a little bit after that was sort of like a big wave. Um, so this was by far the most Bruce Springsteen music I've heard in my life. I like, I mean, clearly a poetic lyricist. For those of people who are like me and sort of introduced to him for the first time, what is your sort of guide to getting into the boss and his music and sort of like... What, what, do, you is, what do you mean by guide? Like, like, what, should... like, what, like what albums oh, are okay. you sort of the easiest to get to? What songs spoke the most? I mean, are you interested in getting into him? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think his, his lyrics, are, are, as you said, are very interesting and sort of yeah. um, speak to people. So yeah. I, I definitely think it would be something... Well, it depends. Can... I mean, I, 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 this film... The closest to the album to this film is an album called Darkness on the Edge of Town. And it came out in 1978. And it's just, a it's just an album of what is it like to live in a world which is unfair but want more from your life, you know? And in Badlands, he has a line which says, talk about a dream, try and make it real, you know? And that's, that's kind of core of the, that's the kind of core of this story in the film, really. But considering the divided times we live in as well, you know, there's a lot in there. He says, yeah. you know, I've done my best to live the right way. I get up every morning, I go to work each day, but your blood runs cold and your eyes go cold. Sometimes I just want to, hang on, I'm going doing it so fast. <laughs> I've done my best to live the right way. I get up every morning, I go to work each day. So there's, what, I, what I think is cool about that, that particular album is that it's, it's gritty 
and it's dark, but it's also still optimistic ultimately. Mm. So that's a quite a good album. It also depends on what age you are. There's an album called Tunnel of Love, which came out in 87, and that's about disappointment and when, you, when life doesn't quite give you what you think it's going to give you. And for me, that's the one I go back to because it's not a mature, it's a mature album. Do you know what I mean? It's not an album for 20-year-old yeah, yeah, yeah. dreamers. Yeah. It's the album when things haven't quite panned out. He has a line you in that. some life and now that's the one who comes. There's an album, there's a line in Brilliant Discovery who says, God have mercy on the man who doubts what he's sure of. Mm. And I love that line. Yeah, that's a good one. You know? Um, all right, so the film is Blinded by the Light. Um, it comes out August 16th. August 16th, yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, I enjoy speaking with you. I wish you the best of luck in the film. I hope everyone checks it out. There is a lot of uh, universality to it, and there is a lot of it that is <laughs> very true to the times now as well. So um, I hope everything with it goes out well. And uh, Yeah, and I just really hope that, you know, films like this need support in the, in the movie theater absolutely. because there are so many massive franchises and superheroes out there. Yeah. And this is a film that I think works really well in the cinema because it's a group communal experience of hearing songs and being moved. 100%. And so so if we want stories that aren't just the formulas and that just and, the, and just a giant kind of, uh, you know, endless sequels, you know, you've got to show the love for films like this. So it'd be really great if people did turn up to watch it in the first opening weekend. And it's also true, even if you're still just a fan of the big ones, the ones that are the small ones are the feeding ground for everyone who goes on to the big ones. So if you enjoy big films, they wouldn't exist without the small ones. So it's yeah. sort of a, a cycle of life between the two of them. They both feed each other. So are you um, going to start quoting from The Lion King now? Is that hey, right? you know, <laughs> I'm not going to start quoting from The Lion King because I didn't go to see that film so if that makes you very better i went to see this and not that so absolutely uh support uh small films indie films all that sort of stuff and i, I definitely wish you the best of luck with the film it's been great talking to you thank, thank you. you so much can't stop me i'm on fire tonight magneto can't stop me i'm on fire tonight even zod can't stop me i'm on fire tonight it's tight don't even try to buy the sign of style mr spock can't stop me i'm on fire tonight the wrath of khan can't stop me i'm on fire tonight the board can't stop me i'm on fire tonight because i've got space game and it feels all right